paisanos! I went down a real rabbit hole about one of my favorite childhood cartoons, Cyber Six. And let's get it out of the way right now. Yeah, that sounds like cyber sex. I don't know if that is intentional. It might be. The comics that this cartoon was based on were around long before that term was in common usage, but on the other hand, those comics are also extremely horny. Cyber Six is, at its core, a tragic love story, a meditation on loneliness and how to exist in a world that is hostile to you. Mood! The titular Cyber Six is a genetic experiment created by the evil Von Richter, the sixth in a line of thousands of such experiments, of which she is the only survivor. By day, she assumes the identity of Adrian Seidelman, the sensitive and bookish English teacher at a school for troubled youths. Unlike typical superhero stories, she starts in her superhero persona, but adopts the secret identity to hide from the world. Adrian is just a performance. In her mind, she is Cyber Six. Her whole deal is that she longs to live openly as herself, to have a romantic relationship with her coworker, biology teacher Lucas Amato. But she believes, quite wrongly by the way, that the world will reject her as not a real woman, just something artificial, a pretender. And let's not beat around the bush here, because I've cultivated a certain demographic. Although Cyber Six, within the narrative, is not herself trans, this is a pretty potent trans metaphor. Like, I don't think I have to explain that to you. Cyber Six, who is definitely Cyber Six in her mind and not Adrian, pretends to be a man because she believes that nobody will accept her as a woman and that she'll be killed by Nazis if she tries to live as one. I forgot to mention that. Von Richter's a Nazi? You probably could have got that from the name Von Richter and the fact that he's a mad scientist. Von Richter is a member of the SS who survived by transplanting his Nazi mind into new Nazi host bodies every few Nazi decades. It's actually implied that he's literally Joseph Mengele, and if that sounds tasteless, if you're still not on board, did I mention that this franchise is extremely horny. Horny levels heretofore unknown. But before I truly get started on one of my favorite childhood memories, I have to give some content warnings, but I mean, how bad could they be, right? Let me just, uh, I got them, I, got them. I wrote them down. Okay, let's, let's see what we got here. Racism, okay, well that, that one's kind of all the time. Homophobia, all right, not, okay. Sexual assault, sexual assault of a minor. Sexual abuse of minors, sexual abuse conducted by minors. Extreme violence, extreme violence done to minors, police violence, addiction, self-harm, and suicide. Hey, um, uh, look, the original comic has a lot of troubling shit in it. And if I'm being honest with you, a lot of irredeemable shit. While I don't want to make excuses for any of it, I do want to caution you against the mentality that problematic art isn't worth discussing or can't have valuable aspects. We can discuss this highly problematic work of art without necessarily endorsing it. I don't, I don't think anyone's in imminent danger of on my recommendation searching out an obscure Argentinian comic book that has not yet been translated into English. Cyber Six started in 1991 as one of many stories in the Argentinian comic magazine Scorpio, written by Carlos Trillo with art by Carlos Meglia. It's double Carlos's. It's a two Carlos kind of story. Eventually, the character would become popular enough to get her own magazine in 1994, which ran for 45 issues. In 1995, the story was adapted into a short-lived live-action television show, which looked like this. <laughs> It's Argentinian, in case you couldn't tell. Sadly, there is only one episode available online. I would love to watch more. In 1999, a 13-episode cartoon series based on Cyber Six debuted in Canada and Argentina. Now, if you're Canadian and around my age, the title of this video is likely a blatant lie, but it's too late. I got your click anyway, sucker. The animated series was very popular in Canada, and the Canadian equivalent to the Cartoon Network, Teletoon, aired it for years after its cancellation. They ran these 13 episodes until well into the mid-2000s. But if you're not from Canada, you've probably never heard about it. The show did briefly air on Fox Kids in the United States, but it was unceremoniously dropped after 10 of the 13 episodes. Cyber 6, all new next Saturday morning at 7.30, only on Fox Kids. Am I who you want? She's gonna change the face of superheroes everywhere.
The original comic has never been officially translated into English, for reasons that will become quite clear as this video goes on. But diligent fans have been making their own translations for decades now, and this video would not have been possible without the hard work of fan translators. These translations are still incomplete as far as I can tell, but a good chunk of the story is available online in a dubiously legal way for anyone interested, though I strongly encourage you to finish the video before reading these comics. Now, I'm a big fan of Cyber 6 the cartoon. I have been since it originally aired. It's difficult not to be. I mean, look at this. Look at this animation. It's gorgeous. Look how expressive the characters are. Look how cool Cyber 6 looks. The art style is just so charmingly idiosyncratic, like the way stubble is depicted by a bunch of rectangles, or the way Cyber 6's cape grows to absurd lengths to convey motion and perspective. Nothing else on TV looked like this show. Nothing looks like it now. It's a Canadian, Japanese, and Argentinian co-production, and boy, you can really feel all three. I don't think I have to explain the Japanese influence on this cartoon in the year of our Lord 2022. This show is anime as fuck, and it's all based on an Argentinian comic, so it has that going for it. But if you're not Canadian, and hopefully you're not, you might not grasp the powerfully Canadian vibes that this cartoon gives off. Canadian media has this inherent hokiness that, that anyone raised in, in this country can, can spot a mile away. It's, it's difficult to put into words. It's, it's like a, a, a sense that Canadians develop. It was intended to be shown in all three markets, and I don't know which language it was animated for, but it weren't English, because the voice work is hilariously mismatched, and at times, wonderfully cringy. Atomicon Fusion Disc! Fellas, chill, dude! You kiss off the Scream Queen! Gonna take it by this that bing banger! Hey, that's 3D at 11! The whole thing is this delightful mixture of unparalleled quality and slapdash phoned in shit that just lends it this indescribable air of earnestness. All these amazing qualities with all these kind of shitty qualities that blend together to make something unlike anything else. Let's go through a brief rundown of the events of the cartoon. Episode 1, we're introduced to the principal cast. Hunka hunka beef boy Lucas sees Cyber 6 defeat one of Von Richter's fixed ideas. They're big Frankenstein-like guys. In the comics, they're set to one task which they single-mindedly pursue with no other consideration. That's why they're called fixed ideas. In the cartoon, they're just big dumb guys. They're disposable goons you can make more of. Every kid show in the 90s had these. You, your putty patrollers, your foot soldiers, your shop tees from Mummies Alive. Lucas grabs a vial of sustenance, the drug that Von Richter keeps his creations addicted to, in order to maintain control over them, not unlike so many Jem'Hadars. Cyber 6 attempts to get it back, all the while trying to stop Jose's harebrained counterfeiting scheme. Jose is Von Richter's clone and kind of son. In the cartoon, he's very much a comic relief character. In the comic, he, he isn't. Von Richter is usually like away in an evil castle, presumably Castlevania. Uh, for most of the series, Jose is the primary antagonist. Everything Von Richter does, he does through Jose. He's a little Nazi boy. Episode two, Cyber Six is being stalked by an intelligent panther named Data Seven. Unbeknownst to them both, Data Seven is actually Cyber Six's long dead brother, Cyber 29. While trying to rescue a local street urchin named Julian from a fire their battle caused, Data Seven regains his memories and the two are happily reunited. Now, Cyber Six has a panther for a sidekick. Eat shit, Batman, what do you got? A little kid wearing shorts? Cool, Cyber Six has an intelligent panther brother, you fucking nerd. Episode three, Von Richter's latest creation is Terra, a mass of living mud that can shapeshift and is legally distinct from Clayface. Also, another thing Terra can do is absorb the energy of other living beings to increase his size. After absorbing some Cyber Six juice, Terra finds he doesn't want to hurt anyone and struggles to free himself of Jose's control. And yes, Terra is a he. I know it's a woman's name. It's simply not addressed. Is that a gender thing? I don't know. Terra means Earth, and Earth is a girl, but they just don't they don't talk about it. I don't I don't know. I don't really know. Episode 4. Jose blackmails a private detective into tracking down Cyber Six. Fuck, fuck me. I'm and I'm and I'm telling people to watch this cartoon. I'm, I'm telling people to that's racist as fuck. Holy shit, I look like a real asshole. We will come back to this racist drawing later when we discuss this franchise's extremely complicated relationship to race. And I bet you're all just so fucking excited for that. Anyway, Cyber 6 saves the day, and it's I don't really want to talk about this episode anymore. Episode 5, Lori, Adrian's student who has a crush on him, is kidnapped because she's got her CDs, which are like 
music store. Ask your parents. She gets them mixed up with Jose's CD-ROMs, which are like, it's like a CD, but you put it, ask your grandparents. They, they get all jumbled up and now he's got to get his, his CD-ROM back from her. Uh, and there's a subplot about Lucas thinking Adrian and Cyber Six are dating, and it leads to all sorts of love triangle nonsense. That's fun. When are these two knuckleheads gonna get the, get together, you know? Episode six, Cyber Six fights some birds in this one. That's all. This one's just about Cyber Six fighting birds. The birds are evil, so she's gotta kick their asses. You know how it goes. A lot of the episodes of the show are just Monster of the Week, right? Because it's, yeah, it's a kid's cartoon. Episode seven, Jose unleashes the most evil monster of them all, the police. He brainwashes a bunch of cops into thinking that Cyber Six robbed a bank, and now they have to blast her with big fuck-off laser guns and he puts mind control helmets on them? And if he's already mind controlling them, I don't know why it was necessary to also frame her for a crime. That feels like putting a hat on a hat. We meet Detective Von Reek, the good-natured friend of Julian, who is among the brainwashed cops. Cyber Six removes his conspicuous brainwashing helmet, and he's fine. We'll have more to say about Enric later. Episode 8, Cyber Six fights goblins. There's goblins in this one. They call them goblins, but they're very clearly gargoyles. They even turn to stone in the daylight, like the gargoyles from Gargoyles. But in, in this case, they're called goblins. Episode 9. Episode 10. Lucas's new girlfriend is a werewolf. Many of you have already become horny about this. You saw the wolf lady and said out loud, ooh, ooh, step on me, wolf mommy. Normally, I would discourage this type of behavior. I would spray you with a squirt bottle or just shake the no-no can, but nothing could be more in line with the spirit of this franchise than being inappropriately horny. So have fun, you little freaks. This is easily the show's horniest episode. You even see a part of a lady's butt, but mostly it's for furries and transformation fetishists, and they deserve it. At the end, it turns out Von Richter sent the werewolf, and of course he did. Where did you come from? Von Richter. I was sent to find and destroy you. <sighs> Was that meant to be a twist? Did all of the characters just assume werewolves were real for the whole episode? Episode 11, Data 7 gets kidnapped and Cyber 6 has to rescue him from Jose's evil circus, which is full of robotic animals. Why? Because, well, sometimes when you want to kill a genetic experiment, you got to do it in a, in a visually exciting way. Episode 12, here we fucking go. In easily the best episode of the series, Cyber 6 is being stalked by the villainous Griselda a monster who possesses all of her powers and the ability to turn invisible. In their first encounter, Griselda manages to seriously injure Cyber Six's arm and then tracks her to fight again during the day while she's on a field trip with her students. Cyber Six spends the entire episode with her back against the wall, outmatched and vulnerable. There's a genuine tension and you really get the sense that there's no way she can win in a straight up fight. And I love how this is visually depicted by having Cyber Six dressed in her Adrian persona for the whole episode after the initial conflict. Conflict. She's cut off from the source of her power, her identity. After a long and incredibly animated chase sequence, Griselda ends up hanging perilously off a bridge over a waterfall. In this moment of hard-fought triumph, Cyber Six can't bring herself to let Griselda die. Maybe she sees herself in her. Maybe she just takes mercy on a defenseless foe. She tries to pull her to safety, but her arm is still injured, and there's a train barreling down the tracks in her direction. Before it can hit her, Griselda lets go and falls to her death. Her last words. Thank you, Cyber Six. After all this action, all this tension, we get a quiet moment where Cyber Six sits with that feeling. We feel the weight of that violence as she silently grieves the woman who moments earlier was trying to kill her. Like Cyber Six, Griselda was a living weapon, but Griselda never got to be anything else. She never got to escape. She never got to have friends or fall in love. She never got to be anything but a killer, except for one tragic moment right at the end. Cyber Six picks up her glasses and returns to the people that care about her. Perhaps, I think, more aware than ever of what it means to have people in your life that care about you. Episode 13. This one's the series finale. An island-sized living bomb is headed towards Meridiana. Von Richter's actually in the city to personally oversee its operation, which feels like a weird strategy given that his, the thing he's doing is blowing up the city. That would be the time I would least want to come to the city, but okay. Cyber Six sees a rare opportunity to end him once and for all, but there's a problem with that. He's the only one that can make sustenance, so if he dies, so does she. And that's a price she's willing to pay. She seems almost eager to pay. 
She goes to all of her friends, says her goodbyes, wordlessly reveals her identity to Lori, shares a passionate kiss with Lucas, and heads to Von Richter's compound to face her destiny once and for all. In his laboratory full of abortive creatures like her, Cyber Six is immediately morose, keenly aware that she will never be human. And at her most vulnerable, Von Richter makes a devil's bargain. If she works with him, he'll cure her of her addiction to sustenance. He'll make her whole, human, able to do as she pleases, grant her the only thing she's ever wanted, autonomy, control over her body. And she considers it, but she doesn't budge. She'd rather die than let other people get hurt on her behalf, and strong arms Von Richter into making the bomb retreat. But twist, he can't. Jose, enraged that his father would destroy the city that he felt he deserved to control, overrode the controls and is sending the creature directly to the compound and they only have minutes to escape. In a desperate maneuver, Von Richter sets free all of the monsters at once to try and subdue Cyber Six. But instead, they immediately attack him. He is torn apart by his own creations, his own cruelty finally being revisited upon him. Cyber Six shares a moment with one of these creatures. It can't speak, but it looks at her as if to say, you're just like me, except you can go live out there, so go live. No longer resigned to die, Cyber Six makes a mad dash to escape the facility, but it's too late. Weeks later, we see a montage of characters moving on with their lives. After all of the chaos, Lucas sits in a cafe where he spent time with Adrian, holding his glasses, trying to grapple with the knowledge that the woman he loved and the man he was closest with, and also might have been in love with too, were the same person all along and he'll never see her again. As he walks home, his face brightens as he sees a light on in Adrian's apartment. But deep in Von Richter's mansion, we hear Von Richter's voice echoing through the empty halls, opining how, although he hated Cyber Six, he admired her courage. Jose presses stop on a tape recorder and grins at the camera. In many ways, it's a great ending. It ties up a lot of the themes of the show. What it means to be a person. How to end the cycle of violence all the characters find themselves in. You kill the Nazis. That's how you end a cycle of violence. And Cyber Six finally gets closure on whether she could ever be loved for who she is. Because yes, of course she could. She is loved for who she is. But on the other hand, I don't know. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that can't handle ambiguity in media. But I, I would have liked one more shot of Cyber Six to establish that she survived. I would have preferred if they had saved that kiss with Lucas until the very end of the episode. Because I just want a happy ending. Sue me. Sue me. I want, I, want, I want him to be happy. Obviously, though, this was never intended to be the ending of the show. It just got canceled. Because of course it did. Adjusting for inflation, each episode of this cartoon cost about a half a million dollars to make, which is roughly the production budget of an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. SpongeBob SquarePants is a little bit more popular than Cyber Six. This weird little thoughtful show about a sad gender-bending superhero wasn't gonna make that money back, ever. It may have had a huge cult following, but there was zero mainstream appeal. So I thought to myself, I thought, hey, Slimo, why don't you read them comic books? Side note, if you're wondering why none of the speech balloons have dialogue, it's because I forgot to get permission to use any of these translations. So I just cut out all of the dialogue and it was very tedious. Now, the principal beats of the comic storyline are the same as the cartoon, as are most of the characters. So rather than rehash the story, I thought it would make more sense to explain some of the differences between the two. And I had a lot of ideas about how the comic would be different from the cartoon. Everything I assumed was inserted into the television program to make the show more kid-friendly, like Von Richter's clone son Jose, the street urchin Julian who befriends Cyber Six, her panther sidekick, the teen punk e-girl were all present in the original comic. Different, certainly, but present. In fact, in many ways, the cartoon is actually slavishly faithful to the comic. More than you'd expect for a property that the audience would be completely unfamiliar with. They went so far as to faithfully reproduce Meglia's art style, for example. The characters all look like their comic counterparts come to life, without really simplifying their designs for animation very much. But in many more senses, the comic book is much more adult, in both senses of the word, both that it contains sexual subject matter and also nuanced emotional shit that kids would have no frame of reference for. The sexuality is, uh, 
gross. There's a, there's a leering kind of sexuality in these comics. Cyber Six very seldomly wears clothing, unless there's like a story reason she has to, for example. In the middle of a scene, she'll just look into a window and see random people fucking. Everyone in the city just fucks with the curtains open, I guess. Frequently, a reason is contrived for Cyber Six or any other woman in the comics to lose their clothes. And there is a lot, a lot, of sexual assault, and most of it is played for laughs, and a lot of it is done by Jose, who is a child, kind of. And that's pretty fucking despicable. That's many despicable things at the same time. It's stressed in the comic that he is not a child. He is an adult in the body of a child with the impulse control of a child. But hey, uh, that's still fucked up and weird. Why'd you put that in your comic book, Carlos's? Don't do that. In the cartoon, Jose was a kid genius, very intelligent, but impulsive and emotional like a child would be. He wanted to impress his father and prove himself worthy of his father's legacy. But in the comics, um, we need to talk about Jose. In the comics, Jose is a sadist who goes out of his way to torture everyone he can just because he enjoys doing it. He's violent, vindictive, and hypersexual. This is justified in the story as Von Richter's fucked up Nazi ideology manifesting itself and how he created Jose? That his cruelty and hypersexuality represents some sort of Nazi social Darwinist ideal. In theory, a compelling critique of Nazism. In practice, it results in Jose sexually humiliating and also sexually assaulting lots and lots of women, ad nauseum, often. Like, all the time. It's basically all he does. After a while, it starts to feel like the creators of the comic aren't making a commentary on how fucked up Jose is, and are just vicariously fantasizing about fucked up things they themselves would like to do. The sexual dynamics of all of the characters make up large swaths of the storyline. Everyone agonizes about someone fucking someone else, often in long, convoluted web of lie type scenarios, where characters attempt to use one another to make someone else jealous. It's very tedious, very graphic, and relentlessly, violently horny. In the first episode of the cartoon, one of Adrian's students, Lori, passes him a love letter and has this dreamy look on her face, and it's portrayed as a harmless, albeit unrequited, infatuation. The girl has a crush on her teacher, who obviously is not interested because he's an adult. You know, like normal. In the comic, she just straight up is like, yo, hey, Adrian, let's go to town. I'll, let's smash right now, me and you. And she single-mindedly pursues this goal for as far into the comic as I was able to find translations of. There's a plot line that involves Lori sending naked pictures of herself to Adrian, which Cyber Six uses to assure other characters that, that they're not a couple by pretending that Adrian is fucking Lori, who is a minor, and then Adrian is not immediately sent to prison forever for some reason, and then of course Lori is raped by Jose, and it's implied that she enjoyed it. So cool, good job, comic books. Why am I talking about this? Why is any of this happening to me? My beloved childhood cartoon is full of sexual assault jokes and weird uncomfortable fetish shit. What a cool day I'm having. All of that being said, and it's a lot to have had said, the comic does make an attempt to grapple with some emotional nuances that the cartoon doesn't even touch. Take, for example, Detective Enrique. He's a little different from the he is in the comics. There he's called Dostoevsky, cause, cause get it? Cause crime and punishment, get it? In the comics, he's a violent, corrupt, and suicidally depressed fascist, more so than a regular cop. He picks fights with everyone he can, shakes down anyone he can get away with, and throws his power and authority in everybody's face. His aggression is presented as a sort of trauma response. He was responsible for his partner's death. He had an affair with his partner's wife and both the partner and the wife committed suicide because of that. So Dostoevsky tries to find someone who can punish him for it by being the most miserable prick on the planet. He is Cyber Six's ally only because he desperately wants to fuck her. Everybody does. All of the men in the comic, and presumably the Earth it takes place upon, want to fuck Cyber Six. She is viewed as this unbearably sexy, unattainable figure. Every dude wants her, but knows that she's beyond their reach. So they settle for just being in her orbit. Routinely, dudes will just size her up, be consumed with unbearable lust, and then just kind of shrug and go, eh, what are you gonna do? I, I don't stand a chance with her. I'll just pine about it silently and do anything she asks me to do. This is doubly complicated for Dostoevsky, who also views Cyber Six as the only person capable of kicking his ass and killing him for his crimes. But also, being nice to her is about as close to intimacy as he's ever gonna get in his life at this point, so he helps her out of a jam when she gets poisoned and from then on, just kind of stalks her. He's a tragic and broken figure, a guy who leans into being toxic and horrible because he doesn't believe he's capable of redemption. 
He's just waiting out the clock until justice catches up with him, the same justice that he once believed he served. Until that time comes, trying to make sure that everyone else hates him as much as he hates himself. No longer able to feel pleasure, no longer able to connect with other people, only able to express his all-consuming self-pity through violence and cruelty. His self-hatred and aloofness mirror Cyber Six's own. A grim reminder of what happens when one lives a life devoid of human connection, particularly when they possess power or authority, and how unresolved trauma can deteriorate into violence. Something that Cyber Six has to grapple with because she's like, the strongest lady. Contrast that with the cartoon where he's a nice man. Personally, I find that angle somewhat less interesting. In the show, Lucas is always unfailingly helpful and courteous to Cyber Six. He's very clearly attracted to her and tells Adrian as much in confidence in the very first episode. So it was always kind of weird to me that Cyber Six viewed him as this unattainable guy, someone who'd never understand her or accept her for who she is. She makes a big deal about not being human, but nobody else seems to recognize the distinction or care about that at all. Side note, by the way, Cartoon Lucas is such a great love interest. I love that he's this sweet little himbo, but he's got this big hairy galoot body. You know what I mean? Like with big hands and a barrel chest, he's just a real solid hunk of meat. Many dude attracted people have told me that this is the kind of body type that, that they're into, but you never really see it presented as sexually desirable from a woman's perspective in media. On top of that, he's boisterous, but sensitive. He's kind without being a pushover and strong, but nurturing. Fellas, take notice. In the comics, though, Lucas starts off as more interested in Cyber Six from a scientific perspective than a romantic one. In addition to being a biology teacher like in the cartoon, he's primarily a journalist and particularly interested in genetic modification. Over time, he gradually falls in love with her, but at first, he has this creepy, almost fetishistic obsession with the minutiae of her body. So he's kind of like a chaser? A term for people who fetishize trans people for being trans. He doesn't like her for who she is, but instead has a superficial interest in her body. So it makes sense that although she's attracted to him and aware that he's attracted to her, she's hesitant to be with him. She worries he might want her precisely because she's not a real woman. And that isn't what she wants. She wants to be loved as a woman and constantly worries that she'll never get to experience that. She's been trained to believe she isn't human and can't ever be worth loving. And that trauma ends up keeping her isolated well past the point that it should be clear to her that Lucas's feelings are genuine. She puts up a wall because it feels safer to her to be alone than to get rejected. She makes up all sorts of bullshit excuses to justify this to herself. She convinces herself to believe that Von Richter may have deliberately infected all of his creations with some sort of sexually transmitted infection more deadly than HIV, but that's obviously not the case since we see his creations having sex all of the goddamn time. She believes that she has some sort of pre-programmed mental block against reproduction with humans, but that's literally just something she made up. When she says that to Jose, he's like, what are you talking about? We never did that. It's explained in great detail how that negative self-perception was beaten into her as a child, how she was humiliated and demeaned constantly to the point that she internalized the idea that if anyone knew the truth about her, they would perceive her as some sort of monster. She could not love or be loved in the same way that everyone else can. And this is not unlike the environment that many queer people grow up in. They internalize all the stigma and implicit threats against anyone who acts outside of the cis hetero status quo. Like Cyber Six, they can begin to feel like their feelings or identities need to be hidden, or that there's something wrong with them. Both they and she are wrong, by the way. Ultimately, Cyber Six and Lucas do end up getting together, though they never really get to be happy together. Cyber Six gets pregnant with Lucas's baby, which is then kidnapped by Von Richter and she's unable to retrieve it before the comic was canceled. And Lucas, this is not a joke, is kidnapped and tortured by Al-Qaeda. The romance is far more pronounced in the comics than in the cartoon. The comic is often a love story with incidental action scenes, particularly early on, while the cartoon is definitely an action story with a slightly more than incidental romance. And that surprised me because the comics are much more aimed at men than the cartoon was if the constant TNA is anything to go by. Cyber Six doesn't fight cool monsters, she fights mainly humanoid creatures like her. Though the series does introduce more fantastical elements over time, like robots and intelligent gorillas and angels, they tend to be allies rather than enemies. And of course, we find out how all of them have sex. She doesn't do cool martial arts fights, but carefully maneuvers and outsmarts her enemies. She's a far more vulnerable character in the comics, constantly outmatched and outnumbered. 
As a result, she's less confident, less willing to stick her neck out for others. She's more neurotic, spending more time alone, talking to herself about her insecurities. Ultimately, still heroic, but far more reluctantly so. She has a lot more to lose. There's a storyline in the comics where Von Rector sends a clone of Cyber Six to kill the real one. And since the clone has no context for any of this, what the fuck is going on, it's my first day on planet Earth, she goes about doing all of the stuff that Cyber Six secretly wants to do, but doesn't let herself do. She immediately fucks Lucas, she takes Julian to an amusement park and buys him candy and shit, and then wonders how her supposedly compassionate sister can let him live on the streets in the first place. She doesn't have Cyber Six's emotional baggage and demonstrates pretty conclusively that her problems are all in her own head. She doesn't keep people at a distance to protect them, but to protect herself from the rejection she feels is inevitable when people discover what she really is in her own mind. And who is she, really? The comic really grapples with the question of who gets to define who a person is. I think we can all agree that people should get a say in who they themselves are, who they're seen as, how they get to present themselves, etc. We can all agree that Cyber Six is a woman. I mean, not really, she's a drawing, but within the fiction. But on the other hand, she doesn't really get complete final say in defining who she is either. I mean, she views herself as a monster, as a lesser being, and we're not meant to agree with her about that. She is just as much defined by the ways that other people view her as the ways that she views herself. So identity, from the comic's perspective, is a form of negotiation. You can't let others define you, but you also can't rely entirely on your own self-perception. And how do you even disentangle those things? How much of your self-perception is just a reflection of the ways that other people tell you they see you? Cyber Six doesn't come to the conclusion that she's a monster on her own, she was abused into believing it. There's a constant thematic tension between discovering who you are and who you were socialized to be. And while we're on the subject of why doesn't Cyber Six do something to get Julian housed, nowhere is the difference between the maturity of the comics and the cartoon better contrasted than this. In the cartoon, when he's introduced, Julian seems to be under the control of a crime syndicate who require him to steal wallets from pedestrians. Th their operation is they get a bunch of artful dodgers to steal juicy wallets. In the comics, he steals wallets because uh, wallets contain money and he needs that money because he doesn't have any money. In the cartoon, he valiantly refuses to steal from others even though, I cannot stress this enough, he has no means of supporting himself and gangsters are threatening to kill him if he doesn't do it. Cyber Six resolves to fix this problem. She visits Julian and tells him to leave. He says, I have nowhere to go. And she says, I'll help you, I promise. And he's like, yeah, okay, heard that one before. Meanwhile, Jose has taken over the crime syndicate that Julian is controlled by and fills the empty opera house they live in with bombs and weapons. And while fighting him off, a fire starts and sets off all of the bombs, destroying the building. And then Julian thanks Cyber Six and Data Seven for saving him, to which Cyber Six responds, A promise is a promise, Julian. Okay. But Julian specifically said, I have nowhere else to go. Cyber Six then blows up his house and that solves the problem? Where's he gonna live now? Who's gonna take care of him? How's he gonna have money for food or clothes? What problem did Cyber Six solve exactly? How did she help him? What promise did she keep? Is it meant to imply that she killed the crime syndicate? Did, did she kill them? Are they dead now? Because otherwise, what's to stop them from just fucking finding Julian and making him work for them again? How else could she have helped? She, she just got his home blowed up. So we are meant to... A take from this, I suppose, that stealing wallets to survive, wrong, despicable, murdering criminals with big bombs, fine. Don't worry about it, Julian's out on the streets, but at least he'll never be forced to steal again. But, you know, he still doesn't have any money, so I don't know how he's going to survive, but he, he won't have to take any wallets. For the rest of the series, Julian just lives in a houseboat, and it's never addressed where that came from or how he feeds himself. D in the comics, they make much more of an attempt to tackle social issues, naturally, because they're not for children. Cyber Six can't save Julian because she's just one person and not able to solve homelessness on her own. She herself is barely scraping by, living and working in a rough area of town. The students at her school are all delinquents and runaways, many of whom are dealing with terrible home lives. She isn't so much teaching them as she is occupying their time until they drop out. Though they say she has some sort of positive effect, we never really see it, but we're told by a school administrator she's making a difference. Her only adult friend, besides Lucas, is a drug addict and survival sex worker named Moira. Cyber Six relates to Moira because she too is an addict. Cyber Six's drug is, is a fictional sci-fi drug, but she too has to do things with other people's bodies she would not like to do in order to get her fix. In Cyber Six's case, it's violence, but 
In Moira's case, it's sex. We consistently see Meridiana from the perspective of the downtrodden, the unhoused, the oppressed, people who, like Cyber Six, have been neglected or abused by institutions that have no use for them at best and are actively hostile to them at worst. Von Richter is also far more powerful in the comics. His creations are politicians and heads of major corporations. He has a much greater foothold in taking over the world, and Cyber Six's goal isn't so much to stop him and his weekly schemes. That's well beyond her grasp at this point. She just wants to survive. She's living on borrowed time, and anyone she gets close to is in danger. She longs to just run away, but she can't because she needs access to sustenance, or substance as it's called in the comics. She's dependent on a system whose expressed goal is to kill her, one which she can neither meaningfully change or escape. Again, this is not unlike the way that many trans people are dependent on a medical system that has expressed extreme hostility to them. In the cartoon, Von Richter wants to kill Cyber Six because she's the superhero that foils all of his dastardly schemes. In the comic, Von Richter wants to kill Cyber Six because he resents the idea that any of his creations could live their life outside of his immediate control. He hates that she has autonomy and freedom, not that she possesses any sort of threat to him. Von Richter in the comics is the Nazi worldview left to fester. He's not just trying to exterminate human beings he views as inferior, not anymore. Now, all of humanity is inferior to him, and he wants to create a new species that fits his grandiose, narcissistic self-image. His superior being is literally just a clone of himself, one that he made somehow even crueler. In one issue, he gets drunk and belligerently demands that a lump of clay come to life, and he's furious when it doesn't work because he believes he is owed the same power over life and the universe as God himself. His influence is so vast and far-reaching that not even he knows the full extent of it. He has an army of sycophants who mindlessly obey his every whim, strategically placed in positions of power throughout the globe, unstoppably on track to rule the world. He's won. But despite all of that, he's pathetic, a cowardly, delusional drunk obsessed with obtaining and maintaining control over others. He's consumed over the one person who ever stood up to him, and it eats him alive that she can't be brought to heal. Eventually, it is revealed that the reason all of the cybers were killed is because one night, he sexually propositioned one of them the very second they entered puberty. She'd been ordered to be honest with him, so she told him that she found him repulsive. So this lecherous old pedophile literally forced thousands of children into meat grinders rather than live with the idea that any of them might be able to say no to him. You can feel the contempt that the Carlos has had for Nazis. And also a certain paranoia about the degree to which Nazis had infiltrated and control powerful institutions. And that makes more sense when you consider Argentina's post-war history. Argentina was where a lot of high-ranking Nazi officers escaped after World War II. Those that weren't granted amnesty by the Americans, Google Operation Paperclip to learn more about that. People like Adolf Eichmann, the chief architect of the Holocaust, and Joseph Mengele, the infamous mad scientist and torturer known as Dr. Death, were both located in Argentina after the war. There were many methods for German war criminals to escape after World War II ended, known as rat lines, which allowed them to live under assumed identities in a variety of countries. But in Argentina, it was actually the official policy of then-dictator Juan Perón to seek out and encourage the immigration of German war criminals, and he was aided by collaborators within powerful institutions like the Catholic Church. You can imagine that atmosphere led to a lot of paranoia and bred conspiracy theories about just how much these escapees had been secretly allowed to gain influence and power. To this day, there is a contingent of cranks who believe that Hitler himself escaped the war and is alive in Argentina, or Brazil, depending on who you ask. Despite the fact that this would make him 133 years old, the oldest human being on record, by a decade and change. But this story is, you know, more fun if, if he's alive, because maybe then you could find him and punch him in the snoot. And everybody wants to punch him in the snoot, so obviously that's got to be the thing that's true. Conspiracies aside, you can feel the contempt the Carlos has had for the burgeoning proto-fascism which gave safe haven to Nazi war criminals. Much of their depiction of von Richter and other Nazis within the story is seething with anger, as if to say, look at these guys. Look at who you supported. Look at what they would do if they were not stopped. The comic also makes it quite clear that von Richter's creations are people. All of them are. He believes they have some sort of biological imperative to obey him, but they have their own feelings and their own thoughts. Most of them obey him out of fear, not because their biological tinkering actually works. They hate Von Richter's guts. They just do what he says to avoid being killed, and that's just kind of how it is in, in fascism. Everybody's plotting against everyone else. That's the way they like it. They think that that struggle leads to the strongest people being in charge. 
Cyber Six can't kill them because they're just like she is. If her life Death is meant to be. Hello. It's now several days later. Uh, I've been editing this video that is in excess of an hour long already, and it is about a cartoon no one's ever heard of. And I noticed something. All of the footage from this point on was out of focus. People will often ask me, Milky, how, how could a YouTuber make a mistake? Isn't doing YouTube videos a job that a little stupid baby could do while shitting in its stupid diapers? And yeah, obviously it is. Basically, my fancy camera has like a face auto tracking software that if I like dip out of the frame, will track onto the Bride of Frankenstein head behind me. That is apparently more of a face than my face, because once it focuses on that, it won't come back to me. So obviously that's going to have to be removed from the background of this video, which I think would harm the video's visual cohesion, but I think I've come up with a clever workaround that should fix this problem. There we go. Nobody would even notice the difference if I hadn't pointed it out. With this type of elegant problem solving, how can you justify not going to patreon.com slash thoughtslime and giving me money that I deserve because of my filmmaking skill? We now return to this video about Sailor Moon or whatever. Cyber Six can't kill them. They're just like she is. If her life is meant to be worth something, then so is theirs. She has to feed off them like a vampire draining their sustenance, but she hates having to do it. She hates having to hurt them and tries to leave them relatively safe when she does. Which, weirdly, makes this X-rated comic less violent than its Saturday morning children's cartoon adaption in some ways. The cartoon makes Von Richter's creations into more straightforward monsters. They're usually mindless beasts, but sometimes just people with powers. The show does, however, go to great lengths to demonstrate that among his intelligent creations, violence is usually something that has to be socialized into them. It isn't an inherent quality they naturally possess reinforcing this theme of who people really are versus who they are socialized to be. For example, Jose tries to fill Tara's brain with all sorts of violent stuff, but Tara can't bring himself to hurt anybody. He doesn't want to. And the moment Cyber Six realizes that, she stops fighting him and tries to help him. Likewise, Griselda is convinced to stop fighting when she is shown even a sliver of compassion. And I always really liked that as a kid. I liked the idea that the hero doesn't really want to fight and would prefer a peaceful solution. So that's... You know, that's still kind of there. But boy, does Cyber Six kill fixed ideas willy-nilly. Oh boy. In the first episode, one of them actually gets mad and says, You kill brother! Oh, okay. Uh, so they have feelings, huh? And they, they, they have families? And I'm not trying to judge here. I am, I'm not a pacifist. If a big Frankenstein is trying to smash up a famous engraver in a counterfeiting scheme of some kind, yeah, sometimes you have to pull the glowing green goo out of the back of their neck to stop them. We've all been in that situation. I get that. I know how that feels because I too am quite fond of glowing green goo. But she could at least have her be a little conflicted about it. Left to their own devices, fixed ideas seem to be gentle and childlike and to not really understand the moral ramifications of the things Jose makes them do. So there's this weird double standard about who she is and is not willing to completely fuck up with punches and kicks. I know that solving problems with violence kind of comes along with the territory of superhero stories, but it does feel at times like the cartoon wants to have it both ways. That Cyber Six is this compassionate being that will only use violence when all other options have been exhausted, but more often than not, her first instinct is violence, and only once that doesn't work does she try compassion. The comic, by contrast, forces her to find less violent solutions to her problems, though she still does occasionally have to kick asses and take names. She can't just, you, she can't just go around killing guys. It's not good to kill guys. One area that the cartoon's emotional nuances slap unequivocally harder than the comic is how unrelentingly gay it is. Both represent the relationship between Lucas, Cyber Six, and Adrian as a love triangle, where two parties are secretly the same person. In the comic, for very convoluted reasons, Lucas and Adrian compete for Cyber Six's affections, even though Adrian is Cyber Six. Just, it's too annoying to explain. In the cartoon, though, Lucas is in love with both Cyber Six and Adrian. Both of them compete for his affection. It's not like they can come out and say that, right? This was the 90s. You weren't allowed to be openly gay in a children's cartoon or real life. 
they were already pushing boundaries as it was. Just look at this piece of production art that I remember seeing on the website for the children's cartoon channel the show aired on. I found this on the special features for the DVD, which is good. Uh, I, 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 I scoured the internet looking for this and I only found it by accident at the last minute. And I was starting to think that I imagined it uh, or that it was a piece of fan art or something. But nope, here's Lucas taking a look over at uh, Adrian's bussy. Now, all of this is complicated by the fact that unbeknownst to Lucas, Adrian is a woman. And not only that, a woman he wants to smash. But still, he's very clearly in love with someone who he perceives as a man. Just watch his reaction in the cartoon when he sees Adrian for the first time. <laughs> I mean, c come, tell me I'm imagining that. Watch how he reacts when he finds out Adrian is hurt and brings him to the hospital. <clears throat> uh, my colleague uh, has been hurt. When did this happen? Uh, this uh, afternoon. You can go now. But uh, it's okay, Lucas. Also, the only time we do see Lucas interact with someone romantically, he's taking her to the very same place that he goes with Adrian every single day. And here he is in episode three, Asking Adrian out on a date. Say, you want to see a movie tonight? What's playing? Uh, a romance. Uh, sorry, it's not for me. Thanks anyway. Yeah, bro. Let's, let's me and you go to a romance movie together as pals. Just guys being dudes. Notice that everyone else here is couples. That's where I want to take you with me, platonically, of course. Maybe we could go back to my place, do some body shots as bros. Maybe charge up our J.O. crystals, no homo. By contrast, in the comics, Lucas briefly entertains the notion that Adrian might be gay and then chastises himself for thinking something so horrible about his friend. And there's this storyline about how a vindictive client of Moira's is out to get her and she's portrayed as this predatory deviant monster in a very ugly kind of way, reflecting old stereotypes about like queer people looking to force heterosexual people into relationships with them. There's also a scene where one of Von Richter's lackeys, Crummins, who he has been giving new bodies to every few decades to keep him around, begs to be given a woman's body next time. Crummins argues that he serves Von Richter in every other way, he should be allowed to serve him sexually as well. Von Richter refuses, and the whole thing is played for laughs, but still, little icky. Most upsettingly, there's Dodo, the grandson of one of Von Richter's Nazi rivals, who's now a Nazi robot. Dodo is effete, effeminate, weak, and ultimately seduced by Jose, who need I remind you, is a child. Dodo's entire existence seems to be to make cheap shot homophobic jokes and to queer code villainy. And that's bad and weird. It's weird that this story, given the subject matter, has such a problematic view of queer people. I'd be inclined to think that the interpretation of Cyber 6 as a kind of trans metaphor is unintentional, but in interviews, both creators frame Cyber 6 as, in their words, a transvestite or crossdresser, which, I don't know, is she? A crossdresser doesn't literally assume a new, differently gendered identity, typically. She's far more analogous to being trans than a transvestite, but of course, none of this is precise language and it's all kind of up in the air, and any boundary we attempt to draw is going to exclude some people. There's a great deal of fluidity with how any of these labels are used, and I don't mean to stick anyone with a label they might not like, or to prescribe how people who use certain labels should behave. But still, in perhaps their own way, with the limited vocabulary that two guys in the early 90s in Argentina would have had, they're describing Cyber 6 explicitly in terms of how she doesn't conform to assigned gender roles. It's there. They weren't unaware of this subtext. They weren't dummies. They knew what they were saying. They liked that the comic said it. Lest you think I'm overstating my case, let's talk about a story called Whatever Happened to Frank Rabitti. In that comic, journalist Frank Rabitti wakes up to find himself inexplicably trapped in the body of a beautiful lady. Nobody believes Frank, even though he knows details about Frank's life that only he could know. And upon inspection of Frank's apartment, it turns out there's another Frank Rabitti just walking around inside. And he's all like, what? That lady's not Frank, I'm Frank. Of course, we, the audience, know that there's some sci-fi shenanigans going on. Turns out, Frank got body swapped with a, with a serial killer lady, and the story ends with Lucas and Cyber 6 unable to reverse the situation, and Frank having to assume a new life as a woman. Frank just accepts being a woman now. This is, what are you gonna do? Sometimes you gotta become a woman. That would be pretty upsetting for somebody who didn't want to be a woman. I mean, that's genuine body horror. A nightmare most people would find absolutely terrifying. But in the story, Frank doesn't like it per se, but it's not a real big deal. And yeah, okay, I'm using he, him pronouns for Frank. I don't know. 
This shit's complicated. <laughs> All right, leave me alone here. Frank also fucks Lucas, like immediately. The absolute second he becomes a woman or, you know, is in a woman's body, he's like, yo, I wonder how it feels to smash with dudes. Lucas is like, well, it's a little unusual, but I'll allow it. You better be going somewhere with this, Frank. This theme comes up again in a side story about a war between angels and demons and human bodies, which is semi-canonical, it's sort of not. It, it was a comic book version of a backdoor pilot for one of the two Carlos's other stories, The Book of Gabriel. Anyway, one of the angels is given a woman's body for the first time because the angels can reincarnate whenever they die, so they, they tend to switch uh, what, what type of person they are, and since angels are genderless, they tend to go back and forth one which gender they are. This one has never been a woman before. They try it out uh, and then immediately uh, fall in love with their longtime comrade, bone down and get pregnant. And this happens again in a B plot of one issue where a shape-shifting creation of Von Richter escapes because he doesn't want to turn into the ugly politicians and businessmen he was assigned and preferred to turn into beautiful ladies because of the shape of their bodies. He preferred to look like them. And maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I'm definitely not. It's difficult for me not to pick up on a sense of longing. If not to live as a woman, then to experience being a woman, to know how it feels to have a woman's body. I don't want to speculate on the internal gender identity of two Carlos's I've never met and never will because they're both dead, but at the same time, you cannot ignore the vibe. The vibe is present. We must acknowledge the vibe. Pause the video now and acknowledge the vibe before proceeding. Frank's story especially feels almost like a fantasy a closeted trans woman or gender questioning person might have, I assume. I don't know. How would I know? Where highly unlikely circumstances converge to force them into a woman's body. Not because they wanted to, but just because it happened and, oh well, what are you gonna do? And hey Frank, don't worry, nobody thinks you're weird or judges you, because they understand you didn't ask for this, and it's just how it is now and there's nothing that can be done about it. Compare that to Crummins, the guy who asks to be made into a woman. He's mocked and treated like a perverted freak. They present having that desire as shameful. But then they write a story that seems like it's set up to fulfill that desire. And then two more stories exactly like that. Maybe that's some sort of attempt to imagine a scenario where that fantasy is safe. And none of this excuses the problematic depictions of queer people, but the juxtaposition between those depictions and the sympathetic and nuanced portrayal of Cyber Six and Frank are all interesting. But you can sense this like back and forth about these ideas that is just very strange. This complicated ambivalence to gender identity brings us back to the comic's relationship with race that I said I'd discuss earlier, and I do not want to because it's such a bummer. Yashimoto, the racist stereotype detective discussed earlier, and his sister Kiko, who is a similarly racist caricature, are directly from the comics. There, he's not actually a private detective, but rather an intern that inherited a detective agency when the detectives who ran it, who are literally Sherlock Holmes and Sam Spade, retired and left it to him for some reason. He has no real idea what he's doing. He's an inept buffoon who wastes most of his time drawing nudie pics of Cyber Six instead of actually looking for his kidnapped sister. Cyber Six then rescues Kiko and instructs Yashimoto to move back to Japan, where Von Richter and his goons will never find him. And this is Cyber Six's opinion and not mine, because all Japanese people look alike to Westerners. Great, good stuff, good stuff. Cool comic book. Now here's where discussing this gets complicated. This hateful and racist caricature is a self-insert character. He's a comics artist who wants to draw a comic about Cyber Six, but struggles to get it right. In one issue, it's kind of like an anthology where he draws Cyber Six comics in the style of other artists, all of whom are clear inspirations for Meglia's own drawing style, guys like Karl Barks and Herge. His bedroom is full of memorabilia of stuff that both creators just clearly liked a lot, stuff that influenced the comic. Even his tendency to draw weird semi-pornographic pictures of Cyber Six seems to be both Carlos's poking fun at their own tendency to insert sexually charged imagery into the comic when the story doesn't really call for it. So they chose this guy, this horrible racist caricature, to represent themselves in the comic despite neither of them being Asian. And to be clear, none of that makes it okay. It doesn't even make it better. I just think it's a weird detail. The contrast between how hateful the drawing is, but how they don't intend for you to hate, dislike, or even really look down on this guy. You're meant to relate to him. He's a comic book nerd, as are you, presumably, if you are reading this comic. And they drew him like this. 
In the show, at least, they made him a competent detective, but then they had a scene where he does a bunch of goofy-looking martial arts, and oh boy, they should not have done that. How, how come you did that, cartoon? As bad as that is, don't worry, it gets much worse. This is Cyber Six's father. This is what he looks like. He looks like this. They drew him like this, on purpose. So based on this image, you'd expect the character to be kind of a stereotype, right? Well. He's not really a prominent character, having died before the events of the story happen, and he doesn't really get a line of dialogue until a flashback towards the end of the series' run, but he's a heroic and tragic figure. When the Order went out to kill all the Cybers, Order Cyber 66, this gl When the Order went out to kill all the Cybers, Order Cyber 66, this lone guy just grabbed the first one he could find and then whisked her to safety. He only had time to save one, but he put it all on the line to save her. And she, of course, was Cyber 6. He takes her to his fishing village where she was raised by his indigenous family and friends, and she lived happily there. It was the best portion of her life. Until Von Richter found them. He tortures this guy and demands to be told where Cyber Six is, but the guy remains defiant until he is ultimately killed, saving his adoptive daughter's life. So, definitely a heroic character. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. But if I were less inclined to give the Carlos's the benefit of the doubt, and based on this drawing, I am, it does almost imply that black people should be willing to do anything to put their bodies on the line and ultimately die in order to protect white people, which does kind of imply their lives don't matter. I mean, I don't know. Maybe not. Hopefully not. On the other hand, the noble sacrifice is a storytelling cliche. And, like, Cyber Six is a little kid. You would expect an adult to die to protect a little kid. And Cyber Six mourns his loss for the rest of her life, carrying around a photo of him in her wallet, believing that no man can ever live up to his legacy of love and kindness, calling him the greatest man she's ever met. But on the other other hand, Von Richter's henchman calls the African servants that work in his Brazilian compound just low IQ enough to be obedient. But on the other, other, other hand, they're both Nazis, so they would think that. And also, Von Richter responds that it's actually impossible to breed the desire for freedom and autonomy out of African people, because their drive to overcome oppression is too powerful. Now, he frames that like it's a bad thing, because he's a Nazi, but it doesn't feel like something that somebody who consciously disliked black people would write into their comic, but it also does kind of attribute the human drive towards freedom from oppression to some sort of magical genetic quality that only black people possess, which I suppose is itself a roundabout way, kind of a racist stereotype. Again, though, they're both Nazis. Nazis do attribute all sorts of stuff to weird racial biological determinism. I could be reading too much into this one. There's one story which deals more explicitly with race in the comics, where Jose... Jose, who is a child, tries to get a black sex worker pregnant to spite his father. Both Ophelia, the sex worker, and her young sister Gopher are drawn in similarly racist ways, but the story at least reflects a great deal of sympathy for them and their situation. Gopher is shown to be precocious and gifted, outsmarting Jose and his fixed ideas with a coded message to Cyber Six, for example, and the story ends with Cyber Six lamenting that she can't do more to lift them out of poverty, but at least is able to be a friend to them. The story acknowledges that both Ophelia and Gopher face difficult to surmount institutional barriers because of racism. Gopher, in particular, is a very sympathetic character, who's meant to represent a sort of idealist mirror for what Cyber Six's life could have looked like if she had more people to depend on. That being said, both of these characters are drawn very much like a cartoon that Disney doesn't want you to watch. Now obviously, nothing is going to make these drawings okay. I hope I've made that clear. I just think it's interesting that in these instances, there's this tension between drawing characters in this horrifically racist way, but still making them characters we are meant to relate to. And just, just so that there's no confusion here, these characters are racist depictions. I'm not trying to equivocate on that or make excuses for it. Nothing about that interesting tension makes it better or okay to draw people like this. None of it changes the fact that the cartoon made their mostly Japanese animation team draw this shit a bunch. To this I say, both Ufa and Dufa. Not a good look. Rethink this one, cartoon from 20 years ago. So you can see that I have a lot of mixed feelings about this comic book. What am I to make of all of this? Here we have a work of art that is beloved, that spawned an adaption that is still celebrated by a devoted cult following decades after it ended. But it's also a work of art that can be challenging to the sensibilities of hopefully everyone. And I don't really know 
what I think. There's a lot to admire about these comics, but a lot of stuff that I find sickening. Some of which is intentional and mindful, and some of which is despicable. And there's something about it which makes it feel so personal. Like you're seeing the good and bad of not just a series of comic books, but of the people that made them. It's the same two Carlos is working on the comic the whole way through, and they seem to have a clear editorial focus on what kind of thing they wanted to make. It is very much their story. It takes weird diversions into whatever it is they wanted to talk about or draw at that time. Meglia's art is phenomenal and evocative, and the amount of beautiful cityscapes he turns out is just fucking staggering. But it's also very juvenile, with a distracting preoccupation towards sex and nudity. It's harder to get a sense of Trillo's writing style through the translations, which are so faithful they sometimes feel stiff and wooden, but the characters all have hidden depths and consistent voices. He's also fond of making allusions to classic literature, both in Adrian's lectures and just naming various characters after famous authors or literary figures. Everyone just quotes great authors at the drop of a hat with lengthy passages I guess they just have memorized. It's a very personal project of these two Carloses, in ways that sometimes is deeply unflattering to them. And perhaps that's the price of honesty. Because when you're really honest in a work of art, sometimes the beauty and the ugliness within you is translated onto the page. Are these comics good? Are they bad? I don't know. Like the people that made them, like all people perhaps, they're a bit of both. And that's fitting. It's fitting that I can't really tell how to feel about them. Because so much of the story is grappling with the idea of how other people might feel about you, and how that informs or constructs your identity. Who decides who you are? Do you? Or does the world around you? If you see yourself differently than the world at large, who's right? How much of what is you is just the result of other people's choices? There's no easy answer to that question. It will always come down to a sort of negotiation between how you'd like to be seen and how other people are willing to see you. And knowing that you have to fight to be who you are, but also don't always get to decide who you are, how do you advocate for your own autonomy? The answer that the story lands on is easy to say, difficult to practice. If how we behave now affects who other people get to be, then we all have a responsibility to be kind, or else we create bad people. One doesn't set themselves free, we set one another free, with patience, kindness, and courage. Those that try to control, coerce, or dominate others will only sink deeper into a self-imposed prison. We must build, love, and when necessary, fight for a world where everyone gets to be the best version of themselves. The way that it delivers that message is often misguided, to say the least, but it's still a worthwhile message. I didn't want this to be as relevant as it became while I was writing it. Uh, I've been working on this video for the greater part of a year, and, uh, and uh, it seems like every week this year there's been some new attack on the humanity and civil rights of LGBTQ plus people. Every day we are demonized, dehumanized, and it becomes difficult sometimes not to see ourselves as the monster that deeply unkind people insist that we are. Now, more so than at most times, we can all kind of relate to Cyber Six's struggle. That feeling that if other people knew who you were, they wouldn't accept you. They'd think there was something wrong with you. But she's wrong, and you're wrong. I think the theme song to the cartoon, which by the way, absolute banger, haven't talked about that yet, absolute banger of a theme song, I, I think it sums up my feelings on the subject best. Thank you for watching. Trans rights, death to fascism. Oh wait, I forgot, we didn't talk about episode nine of the cartoon. Here's the thing. The events of this episode actually happened to me, cartoons are real, and the government doesn't want you to know about it. Hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, it's very convenient that there's an entire episode of Cyber Six about a giant monster eyeball. Really laid this one up for us to put eyeballs on, on small leftist projects. I have a question for you. What is a female? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? <laughs> I don't mean culturally or biologically. We know that shit. We get it. I mean mathematically. How could we use sums and figures to explain the complex relationship between biology, gender, and how statistics can be weaponized and manipulated? 
This video by Scraptex uses distribution curves to talk about how human sex and gender business is more complex than it is often framed by shitheads. But also, more generally, how approximations may be useful for statistics but fail individuals. But enough math! Let's talk love. All the romance in Cyber 6 has probably got you wondering, hey, how did capitalism fuck up romance for everybody? How did it make it harder for me to get the smooches I need? In Commodification of Love, Kiri Magic goes over some of the ways that capitalism has infected and co-opted romantic love, and how that serves as a microcosm for how it gatekeeps the necessities of life more generally. I don't know if you've heard about this capitalism stuff, but it's up to no good. Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see here in the eyeball zone? Hello and welcome to the sun of the eyeball zone. Here in the sun of the eyeball zone, the rules go out the fucking window, baby. I'll highlight anything. I don't give a fuck. Is it a project? Is it small? Who cares? This is my show. I do what I want. I don't answer to you. And now let's bring that energy down for a second because we have to be serious now. And content warning for discussion of sexual assault. A Toronto community organizer named Nicole really needs our help. Nicole is looking to exit sex work after having been assaulted multiple times and could use a helping hand if you have some money to give. Mexi from Positive Leftist News has organized a GoFundMe that you'll find in the description and it would mean a lot to me if you check it out. We've talked a lot in this video about different struggles that both trans women and sex workers can face and if any of that moved you, this is an opportunity to help. If you have a small leftist project you'd like to eyeball, send no more than one email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeball in the subject line and pertinent details, such as your pronouns, and perhaps you shall find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone.